My guest today is Steve Mildenhall, Principal at Convex Risk, former Assistant Professor of Actuarial Science at St. John's University, and former CEO of Analytics at Aon. Today we are picking up the thread again in our talk about the history of the macro environment of insurance as part of a course Steve is designing on pricing insurance risk. Steve, welcome back again. Thanks for having me. So we're going to, this is like a brown two, right? And what I think I'd like to do is just recap kind of what I took away. I mean, the, the two, I've still been thinking about it and talking to people about it since we, since we talked. Uh, you have this data set that you've put together, which goes back farther in time than any other publicly available data set that, that, that I've seen anyway. And I know you researched that very carefully. It was an hour per year you added or something like that. Uh, <laughs> um, and then the, the, the part of that that I found most profound uh, shocking, really, uh, in like a good way, was the eras of insurance. So I'm wondering if you could just recap quickly the first bunch of slides we got through, and then we'll finish off the deck today. Sounds good. Okay. So the data set that uh, is, I think, very interesting in terms of looking at macro insurance cycles is this premium to GDP ratio. Uh, this is generally available sort of from 1968 forward, and you see the three cycles. There was the liability cycle in the 70s. There was the LMX cycle in the 80s, and then there was the post-World Trade Center cycle. And then we've had more recently a very interesting sort of flat period here where kind of nothing happened through most of the 2010s, uh, relatively low sort of premium level relative to the last 50 years, and a little bit of a spike in the last couple of years. The most 2020 number is, is almost all driven by GDP down rather than uh, premium up. And so in case, in case, actually one thing I'll add here, Steve, in case people are only listening on audio, because I got a little feedback that people were doing that. Um, the main thing you see here is, like you said, flat and net written premium to GDP ratio through about 10 years or so, which is, if you look back to the prior pieces of the graph, is incredibly, I mean, unbelievably unusual. We have this amplitude of cycles, the premium spikes and drops, um, but then lately just kind of been a barren desert of excitement. We've traded within sort of about a quarter of a percentage point, uh, whereas previously we've seen swings of over a percentage point in just a couple of years. Of GDP uh, in insurance premium. I mean, that's big numbers, big Which numbers. Is, you know, big, big, big secular shifts. And, you know, we talked about that a lot of these cycles, you know, we, if you have been in the industry, you can put your finger on what caused them. Um, LMX Spiral being a, being a big one. Uh, most recently, uh, Harvey Irma and Maria so sort of maybe kicking off the, the hard market. Um, other things that you would have expected to cause a big blip, maybe not so much. Katrina, hardly visible. Even uh, Northridge and Andrew, really hardly visible, although obviously very significant impacts for uh, different lines of business. Uh, we saw how over time, sort of since the Second World War, kind of through the mid-1990s, you had a, a secular increase in insurance penetration into the economy and the sort of clear underwriting cycle that people love to talk about of, of, of periods of sort of relatively harder premium, relatively softer premium. But that since sort of, you know, sometime around 1990, really that pattern broke down completely. Uh, we've seen sort of a retrenchment in uh, volume of, of premium uh, as a percentage of the economy for various reasons, um, tax uh, changes that happened in 1986 pollution exclusion, claims made form, and lower interest rates, probably uh, most significant there. And really kind of a different pattern that's happened uh, sort of subsequent to, to 1990. And then we looked at, uh, I'll just skip over these few slides, but we looked at uh, also uh, the surplus to GDP, and we looked at the relationship between premium to GDP and surplus to GDP to try and predict out, okay, what is gonna drive a hard market? And, and the regression on the right here is trying to predict kind of next year's premium to GDP ratio, just knowing this year's surplus to GDP ratio. And this is based on that kind of the third phase of, of the uh, history we've got from 1986 onwards. We see a pretty strong linear relationship here uh, between surplus to GDP and premium to GDP. So it's clearly, it's expressing the idea that if we wanna see premium really kind of jump up, that's you know probably gonna be associated with some surplus side shock, uh, taking surplus out of the system. And you know, one of the explanations for the, the flat uh, premium rates that we've seen more recently is that actually the industry has got much better at getting surplus into the industry. You can set up a new co, you know, you, you've got all the alternative capital that backs cap capacity these days. That can all be done much more quickly and effectively maybe than it's been done in the past. 
And so maybe the days of these giant swings are are gone. Uh, um, is, is certainly an argument that could be made. So if I could just kind of just emphasize something amazing here. Again, for the, if somebody's not looking at this, it's pretty easy to visualize. You see a line from the upper left to the lower right hand corner, and then that shows that the higher the premium to GDP ratio is, the lower the surplus to, ra- surplus to GDP ratio is, uh, the prior year surplus to GDP ratio. So it shows that like if you have a decrease in surplus to GDP ratio, the premium goes up, um, which is pretty self-evident, I think, to those of us in the insurance industry, but your R squared of 0.86 is incredible. And how stable this relationship has been over a long period of time is, I mean, creepy. <laughs> like It's unbelievable. <laughs> It's 35 years, right? It's a generation of, uh, of underwriters and actuaries right there. Yeah. So should we pick up the story again, Steve? Anything else to say on a recap? Or we can go to individual lines of business. We can break this down. Right. Let's look at uh, individual lines. That, and, and really, you know, so why do we have all this surplus here? Uh, <laughs> we have it because insurance is a risky business, yeah. right? And so we want to get our arms around what is the, the risk. And uh, how does that vary by, by line of business? So the first place that you might think to look at that is let's look at direct loss ratios over time. And what I've got here, the, the chart if, for uh, those just listening, is, is there's 12 plots that show the major kind of U.S. statutory lines of business since 1992. And this is where to get, I wanted to get the 92. Uh, you can get back to 96 reasonably easily, but I, I wanted 92 because I wanted Andrew and Northridge in there. Plus, I started working in 92, so I was sort of attached to 92. So this is, it was getting this data in that took kind of several hours per, per year to, to type in manually off, off some scans. So uh, this is calendar year num- numbers. It's from the insurance expense exhibit on a, on a direct uh, basis. And I've got lines. I've got uh, commercial multi-peril, commercial auto, commercial property, financial guarantee, which is all the financial lines plus mortgage guarantee in there homeowners, uh, inland marine, liability, MedMal, other commercial, which is things like sort of aviation, all those sort of smaller uh, commercial line uh, covers, personal auto, work comp, and total. And there's a lot of information on these plots. So it, let's just look at um, uh, one of them, and I'll, I'll just uh, talk you through this. So if we look at the top left-hand corner there, it's CMP. So the solid wiggly line that is your direct loss ratio over time. So you can see for CMP, that's varying between a high of about sort of 95-ish that we hit in, in Andrew and that we hit in, in uh, 01, uh, down to a low in the sort of 50-ish percent range that we saw uh, in 2004, 2000. I find that very surprising. I mean, 95 loss ratio in Andrew again in 2001 for very different reasons, um, or you know, the 2001 is a mix of reasons, I suppose. Um, but I would have thought that, you know, even if you're narrowing, cause recurrence multi-parallel is, uh, I mean, it's substantially property. I don't know that it's dominated, but you know, some, you probably can, maybe, you know, what this breakdown is between property and liability. And it's about 50, yeah, okay. 50. it's about 50, 50 between the two. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of cat exposure. <laughs> um, it's just surprising to me that even within that very minimal amount of bundling, you have a lot of stability. It's surprising. Well, okay, so, so let's let's look at this. I want to just sort of draw your attention to the various statistics we've got. Sure. Because I was trying to think, all right, so how, how do we measure risk, right? Well, the first place you look to measure risk is you just look at the standard deviation. Right. So that's what's reported in the title there. It says SD, in this case, it's 11.1%. And um, there's two blue lines you see that sort of go from about sort of 50 to plus 92 blue horizontal lines. They are plus or minus the confidence interval that you would expect the loss ratio to fall within if the loss ratios were actually just normally distributed, right? Mm-hmm. So there, are, I think there's 22 years of data here. So I'm just doing sort of fee inverse, you know, 23 over 22, which is about 1.7 standard deviations uh, from the mean. And you can actually see if, as, you, as you look across, most of the time, that is actually a pretty good uh, estimate of the range of loss ratios. Amazing. Again, okay. Well, look at standard deviation CMP for about 11%. And if you look across, you know, commercial auto liability, don't have cats is 8.2%. So obviously much lower commercial property. On the other hand, you can see very volatile 32%, right? So that that's not a bad measure of, of risk that you're, you're hey, can I, can I just, so I'm saying amazing. I'm having all these like, uh, uh, awesome, you know, like sort of noises I'm making here. 
Whereas if you were just a, you know, if you're just a statistician walking up and, and you said, well, you know, the last 25 years are pretty well described by the normal distribution. You'd be like, hmm, nothing to see here. And off you go. Be like, but you know, I've been trained so much, right. Uh, in the actuarial profession to say like, you know, the normal distribution, um, it doesn't work. And we have all these other distributions and we learn all this crazy transformations we do, um, you know, in the, in the, in the curriculum, um, because of the, the long tail nature of the business. So the fact that you're, and again, we're talking about loss ratios here, so it's not quite the same as losses, but, um, in the fact that you're showing that it actually works okay for some subsets of the business <laughs> is interesting. Yeah. And I, I guess, so I, you know, you have discussions with folks when you start to get into measuring risk and exactly as you say, there's this feeling that we don't like standard deviation. We don't like normal. And there's a feeling that maybe we actually want to measure some sort of PML like number, but not a one in 100 or one in 250, we want to think about maybe a one in 10 or a one in 20 year kind of statistic. And what I find interesting out of this is that this is saying, so we've got 22 years of data here. So the worst measure is, you know, that's an estimate of your sort of one in 22 result. And we're saying, actually, that's pretty well captured by a normal model with the standard deviation. And, you know, it's 1.7 standard deviations from the mean. So yeah, I agree. I think, uh, the, the, the old guys of statistics, they know what they knew what they were doing with standard deviation. It's a very, it's a very good. It is. It, it's very, I, I find though, if I could just like, uh, whine for a second, it is hard to communicate to non-practitioners. So, I mean, standard deviation, what is it, you know, I mean, it, what are the units of that? Something strange. It's like the root of a squared quantity. It's like, it's, it's a bizarre, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard tool for communication. I can attack standard deviation a little bit here. I, I, I agree with that. Yes, there's something more tangible about saying, you know, the, the, the worst year in the last 20 has been such and such. So yeah, I, I agree with that. And one of the big complaints that you hear about standard deviation is that, um, well, there's a difference between the upside and the downside, right? If I have a big up loss, I care about that a lot. But if I have a big down loss, you know, that's actually a great year. And I shouldn't treat those two things uh, symmetrically. So I've address that somewhat the the number in parentheses after the standard deviation so for C, cmp there the 0.066 that's actually the semi deviation so that's just the upside you know the worst loss ratio uh, deviation that you're getting out of this and if you look through you see you know that number is very, clearly very highly correlated to the yep. standard deviation so it's, it's not clear that you're actually getting a whole lot out of, um, you know, looking at the semi-deviation as opposed to the... the yeah, interesting. Um, so the next thing we've got here uh, that we could worry about is, well, what's the correlation of this line to the total? So that's shown with the COR. So for CMP, that's it's very high, actually, 91.5%. It's one of the most highly uh, correlated <laughs> lines, I think, that we've got here. Uh, whereas, you know, commercial auto, 41%. Commercial property, 72%. Homeowners seventy percent. So, what you're seeing consistently across these lines is that something I think you know, all actuaries are aware of is, is correlation is real and it matters. And you're seeing you know pretty substantial correlations to the total uh, across most of these. Uh, most of That's these interesting. Lines. So, if if the commercial multi peril is most highly correlated, that tells me, of course, the other ones are less correlated. But it, would you say it was? It was 0. 0.8 or something like that for CMP. 0.915. It's the COR number. Right. Okay. Yep. That. Point. So that's quite, that's quite big. Um, but the, right. and none of them are, I mean, they're all, they're all compositions of, it is a composition of all the other ones, right? So they're all pieces of it. Which one's the least that is it workers comp at 0.6? Uh, financial guarantee because it had the Right. So it's spike. flat, 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 nothing, 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 kablamo for but then interestingly, other than C, if you t the other two that are low correlation are then the auto lines, right? Auto, personal auto, 48%, commercial auto, 41%. And I should say here, the, the thin gray line that's in each plot, that is the total. So, so you can sort of eyeball the correlation for that. And, and if you look across, actually, CMP, it's, it's actually stunningly correlated. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going on is, in part, it's got property and it's got liability, right? So it gets yeah. a spike where you have a cat which the industry gets the spike because it has, you know, homeowners and that other commercial property, but it also is influenced by the liability side. So I think it probably makes sense that it's got that highest correlation that we're, we're seeing there. And you can see it aligns just looking right, the blue line and the gray line in the top left uh, are clearly very highly correlated, right? The spikes there, I think every year it moves together a couple of years, maybe where it doesn't, but it's pretty. Yeah. Hard. And, you know, a few other thoughts. So one, uh, the composition, you know, kind of point there, um, 
but also that there's this other idea, which is that capacity is correlated as well. So you're kind of taking from one side of the house to pay another, right? Um, your capital is shared across these businesses because they're all insurance companies with a portfolio um, as well. So, you know, you got to imagine that a property writer to some extent will be constrained in a very hard casualty market uh, because all the, all the money is being used over there. I think. All right, so so we're, let's continue to think about the risk though of this, right? And and you could ask, well, is standard deviation of loss ratio in that way that I've computed there, which is, you know, across the years, is that actually a good measure of the, you know, risk of, of the line? And um, something that just sort of springs to mind here is, it, 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 I remember looking at, uh, the Schedule P for a very large um, personal auto writer. Uh, in fact, the largest personal auto writer. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, many years ago, they had a fairly substantial increase in their loss ratio because the, the market had been, uh, there had been a lot of competition in the market, and I think they'd held the line on rate, and they decided that they were done with losing market share, and they took some fairly aggressive uh, rate actions to sort of address that. And so their loss ratio jumped up, but if you looked at their Schedule P, they knew exactly what they were doing because they nailed the, you know, there was no development after 12 months, right? They booked the number after 12 months and it went up. So it was a sort of explainable mm. increase. So really what we'd like to look at here is we want a, a measure of the unexpected um, loss ratio change, right? If I know I take a lot of rate or I, I, I lower rates, right? I know what's gonna happen to the loss ratio the question really is, after I've adjusted for all of that, what's that residual uh, volatility? Now, that's obviously a hard thing at this macro level where we're just looking at industry trends. That's a hard thing to pick up. I don't, you know, I, I could try and do some fancy, you know, uh, on leveling and trending process and what have you, but I don't really have the information available to me to, to run an analysis like that. So instead, what I, what I did was I just looked at Let's just fit an autoregressive model for the loss ratio, right? But probably it's just like the weather. The best estimate of loss ratio at a high level for next year is going to just be, I'll take my loss ratio for this year. And yeah, yeah, if, ideally we would adjust for rate and trend, but, you know, I don't know that. So let's just do an AR1 model. So on each of the plots, you see there's a colored dotted line as well, and that's the AR1 fit, okay? And so you look at commercial auto, for example, the second one there, the orange one, you can see there's, there's a quite a lot of volatility in that loss ratio. You've got the big cycle effect, right? 8.2% standard deviation. But it's sort of predictable in the sense it goes up and then it goes down and, you know, then it goes up again. Your AL1 fit is actually pretty good. And the residual error of that autoregressive fit is only 3.8%. So that's the RSE0 that's shown in the second line of the title there. Shows you sort of the unpredictable volatility for the line just based on a simple AR1 model. And then also in the second line, I report the R squared there. So you can see for commercial auto, it's a, it's, you know, it's 80% R squared. So that's actually a pretty good fit. So that would argue that, you know, commercial auto maybe is not really as volatile as the standard deviation would lead you to believe, you know, once you sort of take out what's known, you, you get a, a much lower volatility. Now compare that to the next one over commercial property. Okay, it's very interesting. So the, there is a dotted line fit there for commercial property, but you can see it lies almost entirely underneath the average yeah. line, right? The, the, the R squared is basically zero because the, the coefficient that got, applies to the last year's loss ratio is basically zero, okay? So in that case, you're saying the sort of unpredictable uncertainty of commercial property is in the, it's 32.9. It's actually slightly higher than the un, you know, uh, uh, unconditional uh, standard deviation. There's a uh, degrees of freedom adjustment there that's accounting for that. You would have thought it couldn't be higher, but because of degrees of freedom, it can come out slightly higher. So this is saying, this is a completely different line of business, right? This is a line of business where, as we know, it's cat driven. So it's all about sort of innovation, the, the innovation in the sense of the, the unknown thing that happens during the year is driving the volatility, a very different picture then you've got with the interesting. Commercial. And so like, you know, I, I think of it as kind of endogenous and exogenous, right? So like endogenous means something within the system that affects the system. So for commercial auto, 
and we're going to come to this, I think, in a moment, Steve. So I don't want to steal too much thunder, but um, probably mostly a pricing problem, right? So it's like it's within the insurance system. Yep. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Yep. Uh, whereas with commercial property, it's like you're getting hit by meteor strikes, <laughs> which are hurricanes and the like, and you don't see yep. them coming and they hit you. And maybe there's some predictability there. Um, maybe someday, Steve, we'll do a deep dive onto, 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 into you know, how on earth you predict hurricanes. I don't know that you can. Um, but uh, this data says that the insurance industry sure can't. Uh, because we don't, um, you know, it's just, there's just no, well, at least the loss ratio doesn't predict the, the subsequent loss ratio. Um, and so, right. And, and I think it's very interesting, you, you know, it's, I, we picked commercial auto and commercial property because they're next to one another, but look at homeowners on the second row there, inland marine commercial property. They're all exactly yep. the same, right? The AR1 model does nothing. The residual volatility is about the same or slightly higher than the underlying standard deviation. So we've got those cat lines, which I, I like, love the language, right? Exogenous shocks drive the volatility. And then you've got, you know, the other, the remaining lines um, where it's maybe a combination of lost volatility and, uh, but also internal kind of pricing cycle uh, volatility as well, driving the overall risk in the result. Yeah, big difference. Now, workers' comp, we're, okay, that one's pretty good too, isn't it? Yeah, so that one, it follows the line as well, right? Well, workers' comp, very, you've got, um, so uh, actually, you know, substantial, so uh, like a three cycles, yeah. or whatever it is. How many? One and a half, one and a half full cycles, I guess. Um, overall standard deviation, 10.3%, residual standard deviation, 6%. So that's suggesting that, you know, there's a much lower sort of uh, unexplained volatility than we see in the unconditional yep. loss. And that one has, the, does it the lowest residual? No, personal auto, 3%, or 2.6%. Right. Personal auto is going to be the lowest. Sure, lowest yeah. Volatility. I mean, that one's going to be the lowest volatility in all kinds of ways. Because even look at the, I mean, it's, you got to watch out for this. Like the scale of the, the y-axis and all of your graphs is different. And personal auto is like <laughs> zoomed right in. Great, great, great point. So, so we, we, we do have a little bit of line statistics. <laughs> so let's just okay. go to the next slide. Because uh, on the next slide, I, I actually show, this is everything on the same scale, okay? So this right. really brings out that, yeah, we were talking about volatility in commercial auto, but it's a, a fraction of the volatility in commercial property that you're seeing here. You know, liability, pretty sporty. Med mal, you know, but there's, there's some pretty serious volatility hmm. going on there. Uh, personal auto here, you know, really tight ranges, and you can see the plus minus kind of normal bands uh, very clearly. Yeah, that's pretty pretty neat. I wonder, uh, and this is a, not something for this for this presentation, Steve, but I wonder what the um, the variability is within the groups. So, like for personal auto writers, like the the most and you know the the distribution of performance, right? Um, I wonder if you know that is as volatile, or, or to what degree that's correlated to overall volatility. That's a that's a whole nother topic. I'd love to discuss it with you. All right, now. So a future episode. Let's let's stay on topic. There's an elephant in the room here that we haven't discussed, and that is the graph <laughs> on the top right, which is the yeah. financial guarantee line. And and it, to the spirit of lying with statistics, I, I just want to go to the next slide. Though. I was very pleased I could figure out graphically <laughs> how to make this that shows what it's like if you don't count the results, you know, at the at the same point. So when we talk about volatility here. And you talk about a shock loss, right? This one is yeah. literally off the scale. Breaks to the top of the graph. I know. 300%, right? It explodes yeah. out of the top of the chart. Um, and so, you know, this is your ultimate example in a sort of Nassim Taleb thick tail distribution. And be super careful about, yeah, because you picked up those pennies in front of the steamroller for the last 30 years, doesn't mean to say that you're necessarily going to continue to be able to do those. Particularly, you know, if the environment changes and credit quality of mortgages change. I mean, we all know what happened in, in yep. 2008, but I think that's a, this is a very nice sort of graphical illustration of, uh, of just how bad that got. Plus, this isn't just mortgage on its own. Just mortgage on its own would look kind of even worse. This is blended with some of the other financial mm -hmm. lines as well. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, you know, you're, you're just to describe it, um, your red line of the loss ratio is up to the top of the graph and then out again an entire chart height above the graph. <laughs> That's just uh, pretty cool. Nicely done. Anything else to say about this slide? I wonder, like, you know, it seems like...
Well, you can you, you can see very clearly the the bands, the plus minus bands uh, for uh, the normal approximation. You know that does track for certainly all the liability lines there. They they you know they're, they're staying kind of nicely within that. But I, I think at this point we're I think we've said everything that is easy to say about last ratio, and we and I'm sure you're already thinking this hey, a loss ratio has got two components, right? It's got a premium component and it's got a loss component. And if we really want to understand the volatility, what we should probably do is analyze them separately rather than pulling them together. So let's look at uh, how that looks here on the, on the next slide. So what we've got here, let me just talk through this. Uh, it's the same 12 lines of business. And then for each chart, we've got kind of two groups of lines. The blue shows the premium over time and then the green shows the losses, okay? And then I've got it, going back to our idea of, we, we're really interested in sort of the unexpected uh, component of next year's premium and next year's loss. And if you've got a line like, you know, look at homeowners here, right? The premium for homeowners has just been a straight line. I mean, they're, you know, very, very tight. The, the R squared on that regression is 98.9%, .9%, you know, straight line increase in, in premium. So there's really been very little uncertainty about what's happened to the premium for um, homeowners. So I'm fitting a, a, a I, I fit both a linear regression and an autoregressive model to the premium and the loss for each of these charts. And then what I'm showing on the chart is if the R squared is, I think, greater than, I think I used 85% for the linear regression, I show the linear fit. Otherwise, I show the better of the auto regressive and the and the linear fit, right? So you can see here for commercial auto, for example, we're picking up the auto regressive model for both of them because they're they're not straight lines. Commercial property, it's linear for both of them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mo mostly, it's 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 turns out to be linear for premium and an auto regressive model. Uh, for, Interesting. For and the exception is personal auto which diverges from commercial auto on both dimensions. Commercial auto is auto regressive in both and personal auto is linear on both. Any comments there? And yeah, so, so let's look at, I think personal auto is, is a really uh, interesting example. Um, and so remember from a loss ratio perspective, personal mm -hmm. auto was the tightest, right? I think we showed a you know, sort of 3% residual volatility for personal auto on the loss ratio. Where is the uncertainty live for personal auto? Well, for for the premium side there, we're showing the, the RSE, so it's the, it's the residual squared error for the regression, and then I just normalize it by dividing by the average premium, right? It's not a perfect measure, but you know, the reasonable measure is sort of scaled. The, for the premium, the uncertainty is 7%. For the losses, it's six and three quarters percent. So you could make a firm case that there is a greater degree of the uncertainty in the results for personal auto comes about because of sort of the premium cycle and the premium movements then comes about because of the losses. And you can see that pretty clearly from the lines, right? I mean, it's personal auto, we, we wouldn't, we would expect premium to pretty much grow at a straight line. The losses m yeah. much more closely do grow as a straight line than the premium does, right? So it's, it's, that is a sort of ultimate endogenous risk coming. From you house. know what occurs to me on this is like this, this is almost, it's an interesting example of of um, distinct distinguishing between call it statistical analyses and narrative analyses, because I look at that and I see three, clearly three different worlds, right? You kind of have the world before 2000, which is, which is, a, which is like a, a, a straight line. I mean, that, I don't know what the R square would be on that, but it's something like 99 point something percent. And then you have an episode where something happened, right? Where the losses pumped up a little bit and then the market overreacted with premium. Right. And then the losses didn't actually, it seems like they didn't, the market didn't, well, sorry, the losses didn't materialize the way, say, like the premium increases were anticipating, as my interpretation here. And so you had this like flat, suddenly the premium stops increasing while the losses keep coming and they catch up and you have a loss ratio compression, or rather, like the lines compress, so the loss ratio goes up. Um, and then you had this another overreaction of premium. So, like, it seems to me that there's like a pretty clear cycle here. We're zoomed in, I suspect, because it's personal auto, so everything's you know everything's tighter in personal auto. But to me, this is like a fairly uh, classic cycle of overreach, actually, amongst personal auto writers in the latter half of the 2000s, um, and then you know a lot of hand wringing in the early 20 teens. You know, so I want you to react to that, and I will add one more thing, which is to say, like you know, I remember the early 20 teens, and it was all about oh my god, distracted driving. It's the smartphones. 
Um, whereas I would say this analysis says, uh, actually, uh, the loss ratios are entirely because of uh, the softening market. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the um, statistical analysis versus narrative analysis. And, and obviously, we do need to be careful with narrative analysis because you can, you know, you have confirmation bias and you just sort of fit the facts. Um, but I think your analysis was, was, was spot on. And, and I think it's interesting to compare personal auto with commercial auto because commercial auto sort of does the same, you know, you can see the same trends. They're just much more exaggerated sure, yeah. in commercial auto. So you see, you know, go, go on, let's look at, let's divide into the three periods you divided into, right? You've got prior to 2000. Well, I don't know what the trend is there on the losses, but it's clearly a heck of a yep. lot more than the trend on the premium. So loss ratio compression. Dam breaks, and interestingly, the dam broke for commercial auto before 9-11. It broke in late 2000, early 2001. People were starting to get substantial yep. weight on commercial auto. So you see inflection point in the premium, right? Premium jumps up, and then you see losses kind of flatline. Now, that's an interesting phenomenon because what's going on there is that's the impact of um, underwriting. It's, it's a couple of things. One is... Some of the losses in, in the early, very early 2000s were actually development from prior years, because this, remember, is IEEE information, mm -hmm. so on a calendar year basis. But then you have the ability in commercial auto to, you know, you can raise deductibles lower limits, and you're, you're trying to cap out the losses. So all of a sudden, premium starts growing sort of in the way it had been suggested from sort of, I don't know, 98 to 2001, got a very steep slope on it. But at the same time, yep. you're taking underwriting actions, you cut the loss out system and you get this sort of massive spread. And then, I, you know, this, I, I think that we could probably do a whole thing on, on auto and, and sort of what's driving, because you see on the personal line side, right, where you wouldn't really have had those coverage differences happen yep. in nearly the same way. Right? I mean, people buy 100, 300, 250, 500, they are, they're not buying two, five, ten million dollar limits. But you still see that sort of softening out. You still, you know, the, the lines sort of track together quite closely, um, but with, with a much uh, kind of and, and smaller, smaller effect. But you see for commercial auto, you've still got volatility on the premium is more than volatility on the loss, right? So in a very real sense, it's sort of self-inflicted volatility for the industry from how we price it and how we, how we think about it. And then you also see a much bigger um, effect sort of eight, nine, 10, the, the, the dip there for uh, the global financial crisis and the economic impact, which makes sense, right? Commercial oil is probably gonna be more impacted by that. And then, so the subsequently we've got, as you say, all the distracted driver and what have you, but we've also got the beginning of, you know, Uber sure. and delivery kind of culture, maybe driving more uh, commercial. Yeah, Amazon, premium into the right, market. right. Um, yeah. and other delivery services yeah. and the technology boom. A couple other thoughts here. So one of them is we have to, of course, acknowledge that the early 2000s was a general hard market. And so maybe there is a capital constraint that's kind of creeping in here, which is going to enhance your premium requirements. So the required return just goes up, perhaps. Um, and probably that's going to be directionally what's going to happen there. So you're sort of in retrospect anticipating, expecting, I would be surprised if we didn't kind of see a bit of an overshoot on these because the cost of capital would have gone up. Um, another thought here is on the commercial auto one, if you were to fit like your, if you were to fit a linear uh, regression to the 92 through 2001, it would be a pretty good fit on losses, right? And you can almost think like that the commercial auto actuaries were probably thinking the same thing. <laughs> well, hey, if we just fit a list of the linear regression yeah. here, I mean, th we can just let's extrapolate and see 2003, four and five. And you could imagine that the, the premium line there would have been a pretty good bet um, if it was in fact a linear extrapolation of the late nineties, uh, loss trends, right? Um, go ahead. Yeah. I, it, it, it looks like the, um, pricing actually is yeah. talking to the underwriters, right? They, they were working on exactly what you said, 98 to 2001. I draw a line, I scale it up to, I get the decent loss ratio. I get the premium that's shown there, but the underwriters were taking all these other underwriting actions that improved the book and cut the cut the losses and you see that exact same pattern liability here you know pretty much the same thing it's shifted over a bit i think in liability you've got a lot more development flowing through than you had on commercial property but you see the same pattern going on there same effect uh premium sort of tracking what you'd have expected from losses underwriting actions taking loss out of the system and you get that sort of second dip yeah one global financial 
and will accomplish while you get the same. The same One of the thoughts that, that I just kind of wonder about a rhetorical question is to what degree do we, can we predict what the Im the impact of our actions will be as a as an underwriting team um, and pricing team, right? So I almost feel like a lot of you know a lot of underwriting strategy is is um, let's get kind of it directionally correct and just kind of hope it's going to work out pretty well because it's very hard to be precise about you know you raise your deductibles by a certain amount and I'm sure they're going to do some analysis. You can do some things to this, but the, the behavioral change that's going to manifest after you do that, you just don't know what the customer is going to do. Right. So, and that's kind of this sort of this thing that I think about a lot, which is insurance is a product that is kind of co-created between the insurance company and the customer, because you can have good and bad customers and they will have very different claims activity given all the other, you know, everything else is the same. Two people have a different, because they, they just have different, I don't know, they just, some people want to file insurance claims and some people don't. <laughs> right. Um, and for a certain certain category percentage of claims, you're going to have people who are good insureds and uh, in the sense that they won't, you know, and then you'll charge them commensurately, right? And so some distribution systems exist, if only to select people with a certain kind of behavioral profile, and then you can set the rate, you know, to be exactly what they, we can make money on doing that. So all that to say, like, I wonder how much you can know about, you know, okay, we got to make some big changes to our portfolio. That's disruptive. I, I you know, I would think that I'm not sure what the hell we're going to have in our hands two years from now after we change all of our underwriting parameters and, you know, you probably fired some agents and all this kind of stuff. I and mean, once you mix this stuff up, the prior data set doesn't work anymore and you're just going to have to hope it works out. You know, I, I, you've been doing this longer than me, Steve. What do you think about that question? So I think a lot of people, this quote is attributed to a lot of people, uh, including Yogi Berra and Charles <laughs> Ball, but somebody once said that, you know, prediction sure. is difficult, especially yeah. about the future. And, and I, you know, I think when you look at this, prediction is especially difficult when you have a turning point, right? Pretty much all predictions that people do, you have to just draw that line, right? You've got a few dots, you've got two dots, you've got a line, you draw it through it, you extrapolate. And I, I would say, um, you, you know, if you look at this, right, we're not good at, you, you look at when the dips come and when the turning point comes, the premium change always happens yep. after the, the dip, right? Or it, it doesn't seem to be a, a sort of leading uh, indicator. Um, that said, in the more recent years, we do seem to be doing, uh, for commercial auto, for, for personal auto, for liability, uh, doing a reasonable job there of sort of keeping those two lines moving in the same direction and, and keeping the distance uh, between them sort of reasonably constant. Um, yeah. The one that draws your eye is work comp, uh, where, you know, and it's sort of different from the other the, the other guys on the on the chart right there um i'm not not an expert on comps i'm not quite sure what's going on there but uh, that that one seems to be uh and we saw this on the premium i don't know if you remember the premium volume right that the premium volume for comp is is um not nearly kept up with gdp in the same way it has for other lines it tracks much more closely with actually employment uh, so i mean comp uh, and to just put it into words like the premium is ridiculously more volatile um, in the sense of like on the upside, you know, increasing and then overshooting this gap. And I, I remember this old chart that I first saw from Guy Carpenter's group. Do you know the one where it shows like the progression of loss ratios in the in the workers comp cycle? Um, phenomenal, wonderful piece of visualization. Um, and I've used that myself to explain to people, here's what this under cycle means. Um, it's, you know, it's very long tail comp, you know, it's just very hard to know what's, you know, where it's going to go. I suppose I've heard some people who are doing long time workers comp, I think reinsurance underwriters saying what in the hell happened in the early 20 teens? Cause like the losses decision show up something, you know, it was like a, like something weird happened and then it is a broke all their kind of like, um, you know, intuitive models, super strange. Yeah, the, the uh, I mean, the quantification of that is that the residual volatility on premium is 11%. And the residual right. volatility on losses is 8%. So, you know, almost 50% higher volatility from the premium side than you've got on the loss side. And that's, the, I think, the biggest, uh, the biggest swing between these. And just, you know, let's just go back and sort of connect the thoughts on the premium side. What we see there, look at homeowners, look at commercial property, to some extent, look at uh, CMP, Inland Marine, you see much more predictable premium. Um, you know, for homeowners, you know, uh, the residual volatility on the premium is only 5%. But on the loss, it's 21%, right? So, so clearly, that's all about cat. And I think over that entire time, it's basically been people chasing rate because 
you got behind yourself with the cat states and you got to get the hurricane rates up up to snuff and you know you had 2004 2005 a lot of rate 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 and then what happened after that was well the midwest fell apart and you had you know hellacious um severe convective storm and what have you so that pushed a lot of rate and then recently obviously we've had the issues on the west coast with um wildfires and what have you and we've also had more hurricane activity so sort of really been pushing uh, homeowners commercial property you see had a, more of a cycle it had more of a dip in 2000 it sort of overshot maybe a little more so it's got a bit more volatility around its premium line it's 12 percent yeah but the last volatility you know for 39 percent so that's still very much a a um a i mean and what an incredible uh, years of of like opulence and you no know, man was it raining gold on those commercial property underwriters during 2006 and 20 uh you know 2016 i suppose um holy cow yeah what a gap although if they were international writers you know there was other stuff going yeah on, so it wasn't a little like diversification i mean you want to just be putting all your money on florida for a period in retrospect of course i'm sure steve you have lots of friends and i that made tons and tons of money they have nice boats as a result good for them and, and then uh, I, I don't, I'm not qualified to comment about it, but then we have Med Mal, which is also <laughs> living in a little world of its own that got itself, you know, incredibly upside down in the early 2000s. And I know a lot of sort of tort reform and, and legal reform went on. And I think, you know, I, I would say that that picture suggests sort of a lot of caution uh, in underwriters in terms of, you know, do we really believe these uh, remediations are going to have the effects that's desired? And, you know, we, we, we're seeing sort of several years of, of both declining losses and sort of shrinking gap, shrinking sort of profitability. And you know, it's so funny about this bit. too, as I kind of like cast my eye over these, over these graphs and we're going to make sure we put a link to this presentation, of course, in the, in the, in the episode. Um, but we're seeing almost like a, a, if I can use fancy words, an exposition of upside volatility, right? So it's like, it's almost as though w what we see certainly in the history of the last 20 years, are examples of in the insurance industry getting it wrong in a way that's benefited them, <laughs> you know? Um, where every uh, these like, loss ratio gaps just widening. Um, of course, there's survivorship bias, and there's all sorts of things, and not every company makes it. Um, and so maybe it's just the smart ones who remain that are, are able to kind of reap the rewards, and that's kind of how the hard market works. But, you know, I see a lot of, like, you know, surprisingly large uh, profit margins emerging at, um, when – when we think about one side of volatility to the point you made earlier about standard deviation, right? We tend to think, oh, it's all downside risk. You know, we're you know, obsessed with the downside. It's a, it's a business that's explicitly exists to risk manage. Um, but uh, you know, there's, there's also upside volatility once in a while, at least on an industry basis. That is true. Um, we're all taught that a rate is a, you know, prospective estimate um but in reality the industry yeah, is right. a giant retro rating plan right that um it, and it's i think the surest indicator that uh rates are going to harden and that people are going to grow is that management stops talking about growing and they start yep. talking about the need to rebuild the balance sheet and at that point they will grow if you go back and you listen you know what were people saying in 01 02 03 that time of period that's what the conversation was about. Whereas, you know, late 90s and, and, and maybe sort of, you know, back into the sort of teens, it was all about grow, grow, grow. But the industry is sort of, it's just going to grow with the economy, right? That's kind of what we saw with, with our starting slides on premium to GDP. You can't magically make, people aren't going to demand more insurance than they need. Um, and so it tends to be cannibalization, growth through cannibalization rather than uh, sort of new, uh, finding new, new markets. And, um, so, you know, everybody talks about growing. How do they do that? Well, they steal business. And, and I think that, too, there's uh, there's a the cultural analysis of insurance has always kind of fascinated me where the I think the very first podcast episode I did was with Rob Johnson, who's a mentor of mine, actuary. And he had a story uh, that he would tell that I've heard from him, heard him many times tell that and I still think about it, where he was actually an underwriting manager. Uh, running a portfolio of personal lines business, or I think small commercial in Australia. And there's a wholly traded company and every year they go to their conference. And then they would, the he said the first two days or the first day, let's call it a uh, day and a half of the conference, 
was the underwriting management and the CEO berating the teams for uh, uh, about not performing well enough or loss ratios too high and and uh, we need to be more conservative. We need to make you know we need to like you know hunker down and you know um, we need to I don't know for, moral fortitude of restraint. You know all this kind of interesting. You know what I mean, right? Like you can see insurance people tell, talking to each other. They're always talking about how we you know we need to have more cons more restraint and raise rates and if only we can talk the market up. And he said, then the last guy that came up and presented was the finance person who would show a very steady, neat progression of net assets increasing every year, 9%, 10%, 11%, 8%. And I'm thinking like the finance, so it, one interpretation is these hypocrites, their interpretation is it's working. Like we kind of have to have this sort of culture of restraint and uh you know self-flagellation or something like that in order to hold the discipline to be able to get that so if you get a little too happy about it it's going to get taken away so, so i that reminds me of somebody pointed out to me once that um if you look at the sort of industry history how many years has the industry actually lost money in total surplus mm. decline very few and, and when it does decline, you know, it doesn't decline very much. Let's compare that to banking, right? And when you went through 2008, <laughs> what was the mortality rate amongst major investment banks? It was 60%, right. wasn't it? Three or five blew up. Well, what, one blew up, two got purchased out of, uh, you know. So, yeah, we, we have, um, we, I think the industry is so aware of risk. And, and it's a debate I've had with various people about, you know, is is cap really risky because it doesn't, you know, you look at things like AM Best puts out that survey of what causes companies to become impaired and cap doesn't really sort of figure on the list. And it's easy to think, oh, well, if maybe we're over overplaying this. And in fact, cat isn't risky. I, I don't think that's correct. I think everybody is so aware that cat could kill you. Absolutely. That they manage it extremely carefully. And as a result, we get you know, a reasonably good sort of set of set of outcomes. Amazing. So I think that probably that's our last slide, Steve, it's time. Any closing comments on this? Um, we're going to do more of these. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anything we haven't covered? Anything you'd like to say? Great.